you know, I think everybody can see this is moving very fast and this is highly transmissible and the rates are going to go, continue to go up. It's a period of the year when lots of people have got things that really matter to them, uh, family-wise, also in other bits of their life. Uh, and my point was, and I hope this, uh, I, hope, I hope I can reiterate this, that um, people want to protect the time that is most important to them. And that does therefore mean in practice, it is sensible for people to cut down on work or other interactions with people, including potentially social ones, which are less important to them, so that they, they reduce their chances of catching COVID and indeed reduce their chances of passing it on. I wouldn't want to um, say to people that they should do a particular thing, they, they should do this or they should do that. This is about saying to people, look, this is a period to prioritise. And that also, to be clear, was a message the Prime Minister also uh, said last night. So just to be a bit more specific, Dr Nikki Kanani yesterday advised people not to go to football matches if it was to watch football. Uh, do you agree with that? What she was actually saying was, if someone went to a stadium, please make it an opportunity to have a boost. And I think that was a, that's a message we really seriously want to, to get uh, to. Uh, obviously, uh, we want to get back to a situation where we're back on a more normal track, and the route to that lies through the booster programme. And what she was saying is, we are opening up Stadia over this weekend for boosting, and her positive message as someone very heavily embedded in the, in the boosting programme was, please take your opportunity to get boosting, and if that means going to a stadium, that really should be the priority. But you're not advising people not to go to football matches, correct? What I'm advising people to do is to prioritise. Uh, if the most important thing to them in the next 10 days is to go to a football match, that's the priority for them. That's really the point I was trying to make. Okay. But prioritise the things that really matter to you, uh, but don't. Uh, but if you wish to do those things and wish to do so and not end up self-isolating or unwell at a time you really want, don't want to be, then you're probably going to want to do fewer other things. So if you were planning in the, the next week to go to... I don't know, four or five social functions, uh, your advice would be try not to go to perhaps the two or three that matter least to you. Well, certainly, I mean, it would obviously depend what other social... Basically, what I'm saying is that anybody who has something that really matters to them, concentrate on that thing and then build out from there, rather than just accepting every invitation and going to every bit of work uh, in person. And this very much applies also to work situations. Certainly, our team are way down in terms of the numbers coming in. That's quite right. Most other teams are, are that I know, and that's very sensible. Government guidance is work from home if you can, and that absolutely remains uh, the guidance now. Just to be more specific on something that's going on a lot at the moment, which is Christmas parties and office Christmas parties, I think what you're saying is that if you're one of those people for whom that kind of party is not essential as compared to spending time with your family, for example, then that would be a good thing not to go to. Yeah, I'm really trying to avoid, and you're trying to make me, but <laughs> I'm still trying to avoid making other people's choices for them. But I would go on to say really clearly that I think people should prioritise what really matters to them and then cut down on the things that don't. For some people, it may be that what really matters to them is going to the office party, fine. Uh, but I think it's, it's really should be, it should be ready for people to make those choices. That's very clear and, and helpful. Thank you for that. Can I just move on to some more questions about Omicron itself and what we do know and what we don't know. Um, now, one of the things that you talked about that we don't yet really have um, hard data on is the extent to which vaccines will stop you getting seriously ill. Um, so, so far, as I understand it, the studies seem to show quite a lot of vaccine escape after two doses, but much less after a third booster dose. Um, could I ask, do those figures relate to antibody deterioration and T-cell deterioration, or is it just antibodies? So there are two lines of evidence. There's the lab side of things and there's the clinical side of things. Uh, and for all of these, and I know you know this, Chair, but I'm laying it out for people watching this, there are kind of three things we're interested in. The, the uh, ability of the vaccine to stop people getting infected, uh, the ability of the vaccine to stop people getting severe disease and ending up in hospital, and the ability of the vaccine to stop people dying. And in general, uh, they get more and more effective as you go up that line. Now, what we have at the moment on the lab side is quite a lot of different labs 
looking at uh, the antibody data, which is half of the immune system, as you imply, and that certainly suggests that antibody response is much less effective against this variant than it was against Delta and Alpha and the original Wuhan strain. Now, that doesn't necessarily, that, that is likely to translate into reduced ability to reduce infection, and that is indeed what we're seeing. So the clinical studies are showing that lots of people are getting reinfected uh, with Omicron who previously had been vaccinated or had a combination of vaccines and natural infection. So it definitely is likely to bypass some of the ability to reduce, in, uh, reduce infection. Uh, what we don't have is very good uh, T-cell uh, studies uh, in the same way as we do, because they take longer to do for one thing, from the lab side. What we don't have is clinical studies, either from South Africa or the UK or indeed anywhere else, that say to us with confidence uh, what the level of protection of two doses, or one dose, two doses, and a booster dose are on hospitalization and deaths. Now, I think most people think on the positive side, we all think that uh, there will be some preserved um, immunity, uh, particularly on the, uh, the non-antibody side, T-cell and other side. And therefore, it is likely that the, uh, someone who's had one or two vaccines already will have some protection and with a booster, considerably more protection against hospitalization and deaths, even though the protection against uh, infection is less good. And the final point I want to make on the boosters is it does look as if they restore some of the ability to actually uh, reduce infection, probably quite a lot of it, actually, at least for a period of time. And so there are um, multiple reasons to get the booster. Uh, it will reduce your risk of severity. Uh, it will reduce the, probably the risk of mortality. And it almost certainly will reduce your risk of transmitting and getting symptomatic disease. So we really want to push the point that boosters is absolutely critical to this. When do you think we will get good data on uh, hospitalization rates and uh, risk of severe illness and death? I think we'll get some reasonable data from South Africa before we do from the UK, but that will be for two doses uh, because they haven't got a booster program in the way that we have yet. Uh, and they will probably go first on the clinical side, but there's good data coming here. And I'll ask uh, Dr. Hopkins to talk about that because uh, UKHSA and indeed specifically Dr. Hopkins herself are leading on this. In terms of the booster, that will take longer, obviously, because uh, as of uh, you know two weeks ago, almost nobody was boosted. Uh, and now we've got really, really good levels in, in the older population, uh, but we haven't yet uh, got all the way down to the group which is actually being infected by, um, by uh, Omicron. Uh, Susan, do you want to add to uh, what I've said? Yeah, so we have uh, a series of studies that we have planned and are, have the analysis all ready to run. Uh, what we know is that we need about 250 individuals in hospital before we can make a severity assessment. Uh, compared to uh, Delta, uh, and also a vaccine effectiveness assessment. We start running that assessment when we um, start having enough cases who have been admitted to hospital to do it, and then we run it daily um, until we have enough power to determine that the results are uh, effective to uh, allow us to be basically make um, assessments to release. And how many Omicron patients do we have in hospital as of today or yesterday? So the released numbers that we released yesterday are 15. However, we are constantly working on data linkage to improve that, and we will release new numbers this afternoon. But just, the real number will be much bigger than that. That is simply the number who have proven, just to be clear. Yeah, exactly. Understood. But just to give us all, as members of the public, an idea of timescales, are you expecting to have some reliable data in before Christmas in a week's time, or is it going to be uh, January before we really know the answer to that question? I, I think it, with the earliest that we will have reliable data is the week between Christmas and New Year and probably early January.